Hi, I'm Jim Deneau. I'm a cinematographer, and this is The Go Creative Show. Hello, and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with cinematographer Jim Deneau about the current working conditions in the film industry and so much more. Jim, welcome to The Go Creative Show. Hey, thanks for having me. So there's so much to talk about, and we're we're coming into this episode at kind of a unique time because you are just on the cusp of voting for a strike authorization in the film industry, which is going to have broad impact, certainly in the U.S. and, and globally as well. And I want to get to the root of what it is that you are fighting for, what people don't know about the film industry. Um, We've got a lot of young listeners that are not in the union. And I also want to talk to them about the benefits of being in film unions and what kind of career possibilities open up when you do that. So there's so much to get to. Before we get there very quickly, I just want to mention our sponsor for this episode, MZ, Empowering Filmmakers. And of course, follow us on your favorite podcast app, as well as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All things Go Creative Show at Go Creative Show. So let's dive right into what's going on in our film industry. Um, For those of you that don't know, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, IATSE, is working to change and improve the conditions of our film industry, the working conditions. And there's a lot of talks and negotiations going on. Uh, This weekend, there's a vote on whether to authorize a strike, which could have really big impacts to the industry, to the world. And there's just so much going on right now. And I would love to just for you to help us set the stage on where we are at right now. What are you fighting for? What are the conditions currently? And um, let's kind of get us started in this conversation. Where are we right now? Every three years, the um, the uh, um, it's called the Hollywood Bargaining Unit. It's 13 IATSE locals in Hollywood. Um who negotiate what's called the basic agreement. It's, you know, kind of everything else sort of relates to the basic agreement. Um, they get together and talk with the, the um, organization representing the, the television and motion picture producers called the AMPTP. I can't remember, but it's the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Um, mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. They get together and and negotiate the contract. And for most years, it's you know there are minor changes and and uh, um, you know it's uh, it's in, it's incremental of things that change. And but this this year, I think that it's and you know and the way that they have negotiated in the past is that each individual local you know there's the locals not just the camera union but also the editors the art directors the grips the electricians um hair and makeup people you know all they all have their own separate unions in in la and um and you know they've tended to negotiate their issues separately but this this year this contract cycle they've kind of all gotten together and decided they're all going to speak with the unified unified voice. That's what the IA solidarity thing. And they asked for um, they asked for uh, some you know some basic changes. And you know right now it seems like the and I you know I'm not a part of the negotiation. I just I like everybody else. I'm listening to what the union leaders say and what I read in the press. But um, yeah. the uh, the things they're asking for are. 10 hour turnaround, which, you know, means that from the time you wrap until the time you can be called back in a rest period of 10 hours. Right now, there are some people that only have eight hours to, um, to, uh, to turn around. And then over the weekend, this is kind of a bigger thing, um, that there would be a 54 hour minimum turnaround. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, and that there be a little bit stiffer penalties if meals aren't given on time, if meal breaks aren't taken on time. Those seem to be the, the three biggest issues. And it's wild when you listen to them and you are outside of this film bubble and you hear that people are fighting for just kind of regular, you know, not even regular schedules, but like there's there's still extremely overworked schedules, but they're fighting for decent schedules and they're fighting for food. Like people don't, I think if you, if you aren't really experiencing that, 
you don't necessarily understand that it's even happening. It also it almost sounds so unreal that it's like there's no way that could be happening. I, I think that is probably the that's I think the issue that is uh, I think there's a communication problem between people that are in the union and that are not, and certainly people that are not in the film industry at all, because you're fighting for something that sounds so. It, it, the, the fact that you have to fight for it is so unreasonable that it's hard for people to even understand it's happening. And th those major tenets that you just talked about, the first one being longer turnaround time between production days. The first thing I want to drill down into is how long is a production day for guys like you that are in the film unions? I, I, and I know it can fluctuate. Right, it varies. Talk to me, Talk to me about the the specifically the amount of hours that you are on set, what it can be, so that people can understand. I've I've worked on shows that had uh, you know music videos back in the old days where they would schedule nearly twenty four hour days. That's not normal. the The typical television production schedule usually relies. All right, so it, and it's all based it's all based on limits, right and. I, I guess the first thing I want to say is, you know, you think about like how long the days are, how, you know, and what these conditions are. And you say, oh, this, the people who are doing this to, the, you know, to these crews must be terrible people. They must be completely unempathetic and inhumane. And that's not the case. They're, you know, they're normal people like everybody else. But it's about it's about how the boundaries are set. Right. Like if the rules of baseball said that you could bring the bat to first base and swing at the first baseman, you know, that's like, or somebody did that because it didn't say that in the rules. That kind of changes, you know, and, you know, so if, if somebody started doing that, then everybody would have to do it because that's how you keep a competitive advantage. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so there are rules and, you know, everybody operates within the rules. So right now, we, you know, the overtime schedule says that we go into double time on most productions at 14 hours. And so there is a, you know, there's kind of a, a, a rule that the studios will say that the, the people that, you know, don't, don't appear on set, but, you know, keep track of the money and keep track of like how our schedules are going, where the producers have to call the studio and ask permission if we go past 14 hours. So that like that's one of those that's like a guardrail. So you know, guess what happens? Every shoot day gets scheduled so that it's like, oh, we're we only have ten hours, you know, of work that we figured out for this day. We can fit in another four, and you know, so mm -hmm. let's see what other scenes we can put on this day. So everything, you know, we're constantly just kind of working out to whatever the limit is, you know, that's set. And I think that's why you know from our end, it's important to reset those limits to. To say, okay, maybe this is in the union. There's no like, like I, I kind of find it shocking. There, there is no labor law in the United States that says how long a workday can be. You know, for any in any business, not just um, not just ours. Um, so, if an employer wants to, you know, work you overtime, they can, you know, indefinitely. And you know, and if you don't want to show up for that overtime, that that's cause for firing. So there's just penalties in how many hours you go over time, but the ability to go over time is there. Right. And yeah, exactly. And so in most industries, like you think about the construction industry, you know, I, my brother-in-law works in that. And he's like, you know, if at eight hours, all his union workers have to be clocked out, like he gets a hard time from management if, you know, if his workers go over eight hours, if they start getting into time and a half. And, you know, so... It's interesting in our business, like we have this model that's based on, a, you know, essentially the maximum amount of overtime that that somebody could afford to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you think about it, if if our if our double time kicks in at 20 at 14 hours and that's sort of the guardrail that leaves 10 hours left in a 24 hour day. So, you know, if you wake up at um, at, you know, if your call time is 7 a.m., your wrap time would be 9 p.m. And, you know, and that, like, that would maintain, then you'd be back in at 7 a.m. the next day. So you think, like, okay, mm -hmm. I get my car at 9 p.m., drive home, maybe now it's 10, and, you know, then all the kids are asleep. 
go to, you know, take a shower, go to bed. Maybe now it's 11 or 1130, depending on how long it takes you to get cleaned up, say hello to your wife, whatever, you know, whatever is going on there. Um, you know, and then you have to wake up at 530 again to, you know, to make it to set in time. And that's where that turnaround time comes into play because you're, it, it sounds like you're almost in an effort to circumvent having to put a limit on how many working hours, you're saying it's not about how many working hours, it's about how much time in between wrap and call time the following day. You know, it's it's all this interrelated formula. But I guess where I was going with this was, it you know, since it's it, like any any producer, like it's not about a lack of empathy or anything like that. It's just it's like the corporation machine is about maximizing profits. And, you know, and like there's no individual there who's, you know, who's I think is evil or bad or, you know, yeah. um, sinister or whatever. It's, you know, it's just about like these are this is where these guardrails have been put in place and everybody's going to drive out to the guardrails. That's just how human nature works. And so, you know, from our end, it's about resetting those to some place that, you know, day after day, week after week is sustainable for for people to work under. You know, I think clients are privy to this idea of, yeah, we have to pay overtime after a certain amount, but it's not being used as a deterrent. It's being something that's included in the budget. Like, yeah, we're going to do, let's do a two hour, two hour overtime day. And it's like, these are supposed to be deterrents. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so it is interesting to see that that's just been kind of folded into production budgets and what the plan is. But I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what it is that you guys are fighting for. You're, so it's it's not necessarily about not using overtime hours. It's about extending the turnaround time. So what what is the turnaround time currently and what are you trying to get to? Right. So it, the curve... The current situation is every different craft, every different union has a, has a slightly different turnaround time. And then, um, you know, as you go to different parts of the country, there are different local studio mechanics unions also have different turnaround times. But so they're like the shortest one, I think, are hair and makeup people who have eight hours of turnaround. And, um, you know, and the longest are, I think, actors who have 12 hours of turnaround. So, um so, you know, because it, like people will schedule very efficiently, sometimes you have to wait. It's, you know, sometimes the crew's turnaround gets protected by the actors because you have an actor who works one day and then they, you know, can't figure out how to schedule so they don't work first thing the next day. So you're waiting for the actor to turn around. And so they'll, they'll turn the crew around on that person. But mostly, you know, your turnarounds are on the minimum for wh- whoever the shortest is and, you know, the, like that person will get their minimum turnaround. The hair and makeup people usually show up before the rest of the crew because they have to get the actors ready. And then the rest of the crew comes in to unload the trucks. And so it, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how it works. So our, you know, our typical days will, you know, will be just about like, and this is what I think is striking. Our typical turnaround will be somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 10 hours just because of how all of the those other pieces fit together. And so the fact that like we're asking for 10 hours for everybody means that you know the hair and makeup people you know if this if we can agree to this will you know get an extra couple hours of sleep. And um you know and that might end up pushing turnarounds if we go into 14 hour days. Yeah, Not a right. Because they're the first to set. You yeah, know. right. Exactly. So it will end yeah. up like call times kind of ripple forward in the week where they become, you know, later and later as, you know, as you because of turnaround. And I think that's so the, the day length kind of comes into a, the amount of work that has to get done in, in a day comes into it as a factor of, you know, like not advancing those call times during the week if you don't want to do that. But I think that, uh, you know, the other thing, so we're asking for 10 hours of minimum turnaround. But the other thing is, you know, that's kind of the, like, this is the the biggest issue is 54-hour minimum weekend turnaround. As opposed to what? What is it now? Well, nothing. It's, I okay. think there is there is no minimum weekend turnaround. There's the daily turnaround. I see. So, um, so what, what ends up happening, you know, all, like, you'll, Almost every week, you know, if you're on an episodic show, if there's any night in your show, you'll end up, you know, on a Friday or, you know, 
what is also known as an F you Friday. <laughs> yes. You know, which means your call time would be uh, um, 6 p.m. and you would shoot until 6 or 8 a.m. on Saturday. And so that means, you know, you've basically lost Saturday. You know, if you if your kids have a soccer game or something like that, you might be able to drive straight from set to that game, but you'll be completely exhausted. And, you know, and you're spending you spend the whole weekend kind of recovering from jet lag to be at a six or seven a.m. call on Monday. Um, you know, so it's that. That actually is is one of the hardest things to deal with, and you know, as like on a day to day to day, week to week production. I want to transition to rates and payments because with all the streaming platforms coming on, what I'm hearing, and I I really need some clarity on this because this is this is not my world. Um, I'm hearing that depending on the platform you're working on, rates can change. Yeah, and this is one of those things I. To be honest, I'm, I don't know that much about it. And, you know, part of it comes, you know, to be honest, as, as a DP, I have an agent who negotiates my rate. It's usually like there have been times when I look at this scale and say, oh, I, you just negotiated a rate that's under scale for me. But most of the time, it's a little bit over scale. And, you know, and I like that's they tend to take care of, uh, um, you know, I, I get taken care of that way. But um, well, the, the, for most of yeah, but for most of the yeah. normal crew, there are there's like a there's there's a there's a bunch of different contracts that you know, and where all of the terms you know tend to get up in the air. It's not just the not just the rates, but different contracts have uh, have different um, terms for you know when double time kicks in, when uh, you know what the meal penalties are, you know all of that sort of thing, and. The streaming platforms, I think, you know, whenever it started, it was back, it was around the same time as the, if you remember, the writer's strike was also yeah. over streaming residuals. And, um, you know, and the, like as streaming started, they, you know, because it was a, a beginning industry, they um, they got a break on the rates and, and conditions. And, you know, HBO had the same thing. It's a precedent that got set with HBO. Um, where they had a contract with lower rates, and I think it, I think that contract still exists. What is the justification for the lower rates on streaming services? I, you know, I'm probably not qualified to talk about that, but I, you know, I think that it has to do with you know it, this. We are a beginning industry where um, you know we're just starting out, and you know it like we aren't fully funded. We don't know what our revenue stream is yet. We can't afford to pay the full price. Can you cut us a break? Um, I think that that's sort of the logic behind it. And and I guess there is some legitimacy to that until you start seeing Emmy Awards flooding into, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> once you start seeing these these streaming networks, and yeah, not not awards don't necessarily mean profit, but it certainly means awareness. And, um, you know, there there's, I'm sure, and I can't, point to anything, but I can make a safe assumption that there are TV shows on networks, uh, on um, streaming services that could potentially make more money than films um, because of just the, the the income stream, how much awareness they get, people buying them outside. That's the other thing too. You can buy TV shows outside of the platforms. Like there's, there's revenue outside of just the subscription as well. And I also, I mean, both of us, neither of us should really be talking about this because we don't know what we're saying, but I th we're making assumptions. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, you know, from the outside anyway, I, I think you, you know, it is safe to say that, you know, streaming in the beginning, you know, it was a small business, but it no longer is. Like, I, I think, you know, they're selling subscriptions there, you know, people are watching, you know, um, most people consume, you know, the people that I know, like everybody talks about what they're watching on streaming services, not on broadcast television. And yeah. so if they're, you know, if their revenue models are working at all, they're probably, you know, they're probably making money. And it's, and I, so I wonder whether the, you know, it makes sense to keep those contracts in place. And I know that that's, 
that's one of the other issues that's on the table is, you know, like trying to tidy up, you know, bring, bring those um, service, you know, those contracts more in line with the basic agreement, which I, you know, I would think that the broadcast producers would want to level the playing field that way themselves. I'm, I wonder what the internal conversations are at, um, you know, at, at the networks between, you know, the AMPTP and, you know, and the people who have to pay basic agreement and the people who get these lower tier agreements. Well, this all seems so reasonable that you have to wonder what is the opposing view? Like, can you, uh, I, certainly you wouldn't be on the show if you were opposing it anyway, but do you have any insight into what the opposition is? No, it's the the thing that we've been told is just that the, um, and you know, that's again, this is, this, this is the story that, that I get, you know, from the union leaders and from the news um, is that they, you know, they basically have just said, no, everything's working fine the way it is right now. We, you know, we're happy with the, the current situation and, mm-hmm. you know, which is okay. I, you know, I, I'm sure they are. Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, but the, you know, saying that, you know, saying that that's the way we've always done it is not really a, a good argument. You know, you, you know, there are a lot of things that we've always done that we realized could be done better and we've changed. And I think this, you know, this is one of the situations it's, you know, we've, we have over the past several decades, like up the, you know, the visual quality and the story quality of, uh, of television shows. And, you know, we've done it without changing the scheduling parameters and without changing the, um, you know, the, the broadcast schedules and, and, you know, and so that's been, that's been done basically on the backs of the crew by making the work days longer. And I think there's, you know, so it's maybe it's time to re-examine how, you know, how the schedules are laid out, how, you know, how show, you know, what, how long is a season? How many, you know, how many episodes do you put into a season? And how, you know, do you have maybe parallel productions running so that you can do 16, a 16 episode season where you get, you know, 12 or 13 days per episode and, you know, get a couple of those going at the same time so that you can have, uh, you know, so that you can fill a, a whole broadcast season. You know, there, it's like, I think, we, you know, as the as we've changed, as we have raised the bar for the quality of, uh, of television, we need to also raise the bar for how we, uh, you know, how we think about producing it. Let's take a quick break and talk about the sponsor of today's episode, MZ Empowering Filmmakers. Now, you want to think about MZ almost like the Netflix of filmmaking education, because honestly, that kind of is what it is. When you go to MZ, you see um, hundreds of hours of high-quality video-based filmmaking education that covers all the topics that us here at Go Creative Show need to know and become better at, like directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and so much more. It's all there at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. Now let's talk about the courses for a moment. The courses on there are just so well done and taught by high quality educators that are in the industry, right? Okay. So for example, one of their new courses, Indie Film Blueprint, and it's it's basically a roadmap for how you plan, shoot, and sell your first indie feature. Who doesn't want to know that? And of course, there's advanced editing in DaVinci Resolve, and basically everything you need to know is there at MZ, including a course called The Art and Technique of Film Editing, which is taught by Tom Cross, who is the editor of major features. La La Land is one, No Time to Die, the new James Bond movie that I just got to see this week. So excited. He was the editor of those films, and he's there at MZ teaching you his craft. Now, it's all there at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. And here's the good news. You get 20% off by using coupon code GCS20. And that's 20% off buying individual courses or becoming an MZ Pro member, which gives you access to everything for the entire time that you are a member. That's what I mean by the Netflix of filmmaking education. So it's all there. GoCreativeShow.com forward slash MZ, M-Z-E-D, M-Z, empowering filmmakers. Now, this next thing is near and dear to my heart because food in 
meals are basically how I live my life. <laughs> so all day, I'm looking forward to the next meal I eat. And uh, honestly, one of the things that is so depressing to me about production during COVID, especially the early days, is you sort of are missing out on that camaraderie around the craft table, which I just loved. And I cannot wait for that to come back in full force. But talk to me about the improvements that you are trying to fight for for meal periods. It's like, it's amazing to me that that's even something that needs to be fought for. But tell me about it. What are the conditions now? And what are you trying to get? It's one of those things where, you know, there right now, the, you know, the contract says that we should have a meal break after um, six hours. And, you know, and like, that's, it seems kind of like a long time for most people, you know, you think like you, like a normal person, you know, would get into work at um, eight in the morning, and then they might take their lunch at 12 or one. So you've got four or five hours between, uh, you know, between your morning time and, you know, and between when you get in, when you get a break. And, you know, so we go for six hours and then, you know, you get a half hour sit, sit down meal. But if the, and if the producers don't, don't want to stop right then, they can pay a penalty and, you know, and keep us working. And so it's gotten to the point where, um, and it like, it seems like this is another one of those incremental things where over the past few years, over the past several years, um, meal penalties have become more and more um, prevalent. Like, you know, like I'll, you know, we typically will do, you know, two or three meal penalties and often for no good reason. Like you, you think it's, you know, it's supposed to be one of those things that gets done in an emergency, right? Like the sun's setting, we just have to keep going so that we can finish this shop before the sun sets. Okay. I get that. You know, there's a thunderstorm coming. We just, you know, can we just keep going and finish these couple shots before the rain rolls in and then we can eat lunch while the thunderstorm's happening. Okay. That like everybody understands that, but, um, you know, it's, they get used now where, you know, because there's a budget for meal penalties and they say, okay, we can afford some meal penalties. So, um, we just don't want to stop right now. Like the, we're in the middle of the scene and I want to finish this scene and, you know, okay. But I, you know, it's like, I watch, I watch people like banging stuff around because they're, you know, and kind of staggering because there's their blood sugar is low and, yeah. you know, and i have you know, people get snappy because their blood sugar is low. And so it makes it makes it difficult to, you know, to to work because, you know, I like I'm interacting with crew people who are um, who are cranky and grouchy and, you know, maybe not quite as physically coordinated as they should be because they haven't been given a chance to sit down and uh, and, you know, not just eat, but like, you know, it's interesting how like just being able to take some time off of a task, you know, to be able to just let your mind not focus for a second, like is, you know, can be refreshing can you know, can help you refocus again. You're supposed to stop working on things every once in a while and, and, you know, and just think about something else, do something else. So, and, you know, when you've been working eight hours straight without having that, you know, that chance to stop, it's, you know, that, that impacts just, you know, not just your, you know, your comfort, but it's also the quality of your work. So. And meal penalties kick in on the hour. Is that how it works? It's a half hour increment. And again, this is just seems so simple. It's it's like all of this stuff that. Well, that's, what's so frustrating about it is it seems so simple. And just, just to make sure I understand the, what your, that's the state that's the current state now. What is it that you're trying to negotiate? The the inability to use them or restricting the use or Yeah, it's just it's the amount of the meal penalty. So and this is one of those things over um over the course of contracts. So, all right, this it's and this is a little bit inside baseball, but our audience can handle it, right? <laughs> meal penalties right now in the basic agreement are a, you know a fixed dollar amount. Um and I think it's like the first half hour, it's $7.50 or something like that. I, I shouldn't be saying the exact numbers because I don't have the contract in front of me. Yeah, the numbers are not specific. We're just just for conversation's sake. In prior contracts, and I'm not sure exactly when this changed, um, it was what was called prevailing 
rate meal penalties, which basically means you're in double time until until you're broken for lunch. So it's a little bit uh, stiffer penalty, and um, and which where that is what they're asking for back again. And you know, some unions like uh, the Studio Mechanics Local in New York, Local 52, still has prevailing rate meal penalties, but. Um, you know, the camera local and a lot of the, the Hollywood locals are all this, these kind of fixed number of meal penalties, and they want to go back to prevailing rate. And, you know, is that going to stop us, you know, from, you know, having meal penalties every day? Probably not. But um, we're hoping that it's some kind of disincentive, I guess. Um, it's, you know, it's like nobody, like, that's what I find frustrating about the whole thing is that nobody's negotiating an absolute limit, you know, that it's really just still all about disincentives. And, and you've been getting an overwhelming amount of support. I mean, this this is a very big deal for the film industry. And when entertainment goes away, we all suffer. Like the, the, the writer strike that we saw, whenever that was, when was that? That was a long time ago, 2007, We We, you know, people still that aren't even in the industry, just people, you know, family members, friends of mine, that they remember that period of time when like we didn't have quality programming on TV and it, and it is something that affects all of us. So what, what could potentially happen here? If there is a strike, it really could have a major impact on you know, everybody's lives because we all consume entertainment and we all need entertainment, especially times like these. So I think this does have a wide impact and you have been getting quite a bit of support Tell me about the support you've gotten globally. Are you seeing unions across the world standing in solidarity and or having problems like these? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've gotten, I, I signed a letter with a few other cinematographers, um, uh, you know, saying we need to get more reasonable about the length of the work days and the rest periods and that sort of thing. It was a very, you know, kind of very broadly worded thing. And I got, you know, I have friends around the world. I've worked in a bunch of other countries, and I got texts and emails saying, "Yeah, thank you. Can you come to our country next and sign a letter?" And <laughs> so, I, like, I think it's, I think it's there. I, I think that you know, the culture's out there, and you know, it, even if you're if you're a non-union, if you're working in other parts of the world, like, what our union contracts are, are kind of the basis that for discussion on everything else. Like, you know, the, like the idea that there is a meal break at a certain time and that there's a penalty for not having a meal, like on a non-union shoot that that's there. People use that, even though it's not in, you know, they don't have a, a contract that says that, but it's like, we're sort of our contracts are kind of the template for how um, anybody who's trying to do a, professional production, whether it's union or non-union, um, you know, that how, how people, you know, how people work and what their, um, what their conditions are and what the kind of basic assumptions are. So what, you know, what we, what we're able to, um, you know, to gain in this, uh, you know, in this round of negotiations is going to affect the basic assumptions for everybody who works on films. The last thing I want to talk about, and I know we're starting to run out of time, but I think it's important. Here at Go Creative Show, we have a lot of young, new filmmakers that are just getting into the industry or that are in the very early stages that are not in a union, don't really understand what it is, don't know the benefits, might be afraid of them, um, might feel perfectly comfortable in non-union. I'd love to take this opportunity to talk to the audience about the benefits of joining a union. What does it mean? What kind of doors could it potentially open for you? So what do you say to those young filmmakers listening that are wondering, what should I do? I, you know, I would say you should try to join the union. And I think that it's, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's a, it's a tricky situation. Like in my, in my situation, if you, if you want to aspire to be a DP, like you're probably not going to walk into the union as a director of photography, but what you can do if you join, you know, like the digital utility position is our entry level position. You come in, you work as a camera assistant and, you know, or like in my case, I was in local 52. I worked as a electrician and a gaffer and you, you get to watch how professional shoots happen. 
And then, you know, in your spare time, you're making money, like you're making money doing the work that you love. And I think, all right, this, I'm just going to, I'm going to quickly shift off to something else that that popped into my head right now. Um, You know, like, I think what, like one of the obvious questions to ask is like, if, if the conditions are so horrible, like if this is so terrible, why are, are you doing it? Why, you know, why do you stay there? Why don't you get a job in an office, you know, where you can come in at nine and, you know, have lunch at noon and go home at five, you know, or, you know, or be on the golf course at three, if you're, you know, if you're a banker. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, if you ask anybody who's working this, it, you know, the barrier to entry is so high. I'm cycling back. And, um, and you know, the hours are so long, but it's really something that we love to do. And it's like, for the first 10 hours of the day, it's like the best job in the world. It Like, you cannot, you know, I can't describe how great it is. Like, you know, we're all working together as a team. There's a, there's a team aspect of it. Every single day is different. You're you're solving problems that you haven't seen before. You're um, you know you're inventing stuff on the spot to make something happen for somebody that just thought of something that they wanted to have happen. And it's um, you know that it's very exciting and it's you know and it's extremely creative and it scratches that itch in your head. After a while, it, it, you know, it's kind of like everybody would say that that water is good, right? Like you drink water, it's good. It's you know, it feels good to drink it. It tastes good. It's important for your body. But if they were to put a fire hose in your mouth and turn it on, like that would not be good. And I think we're um, we're uh, you know we're uh, we're in the uh, situation where it's. Just it's not that we don't like our jobs and it's not that we don't like the the people that we work with, but it's just too much of of one thing. You know, like we need, you know, we just need to have a, a more reasonable schedule of, you know, working and taking a break. Well, you're fighting to make the thing you love more able to happen. Like you you want you want more people to join the union. You want we want more people in filmmaking. Like you guys are trying to make the conditions such that this can be sustainable. And I think that it's you know it's interesting. Like, you know, you read IA stories and you know there's some harrowing stories on there. And but I you know I, and many of them are not unique to the film business. Like I worked in restaurants before I got into um into shooting and you know the hours in restaurants are you know can be extremely long and the conditions are difficult you're in you know you're in hot kitchens and uh you know and it's just you know and you're working fast and it's a grind and you know it's it's um but there's also there's also that same camaraderie and there's the you know sense of people who love food working together so i think it's you know it it's not unique to to our business, but I think, you know, this is where we are. This is the thing that, that, you know, this is the area that we can work on. And, and I, you know, so what I would say to people who want to get into, you know, want to get into this, who still have not been frightened away by, you know, the IA stories, Instagram, or, you know, because it, it, it's, it is a great job. No, no, nobody here is frightened out of the business. There's just no way. I mean, they're doing it because they love it and they, they're they supportive of the move here. I think it's more about inspiring them to join. What what are the benefits to it? Because you hear a lot of people will say like, if oh, if I join the union, I can't do non-union. Therefore, I'll be missing out on some work. And I think that could be valid, valid if, it's, if it's true. And I don't even know if that's true. But it's like th- that transition period is scary. Any new is scary sometimes. What can you tell those people that are right on the edge trying to see what is my next step in my career? Well, I think if you're, you know, if if what your goal is to be, um, you know, a lighting technician or a grip or, uh, you know, you know, one of the a, a set operator, basically, if you if you want to be in the art department or props or something like that, I think it, you know, it behooves you to get into the union, not just because of, you know, the access to, you know, jobs from bigger producers that, our union signatories, but it's, um, the, you know, there's the, the culture of the union, the, you know, the, the working methods that have been developed over the years. It's like you, you come into a, a, you know, you come into a family that has, that, you know, that has kind of figured out how things work and, you know, you're, 
you'll be work you'll be exposed to working at the top of your game for for that sort of thing the union um you know and there are hopefully some basic protections to you know the length of your workday and you know and your rate um and aside from that the the employers pay into a health plan and uh, a pension plan which you know when you're young pension plans seem less pressing but you know when you get to my age i'm like oh this is this is actually a good idea um so it's i think that it's and and the you know the the sort of last the last reason is you know that by sticking together like when you're in a union you're basically saying you know, we we agree to compete on the basis of how good we are. You know, we're all freelancers, right? It's not a hiring hall. It's not where it's like, oh, here's the guy with most seniority. He's going to go, you know, work on this machine. Um, we're, you know, we're all com- we're still all competing for freelance jobs, but we're just saying like, this is how I'm not going to, you know, undercut people on rate. We're not going to race to the on the rate. We're going not going to race to the bottom on. Um, you know, on this, this is going to be, um, uh, you know, we're going to compete on how good we are and, um, you know, and how, uh, how well we develop our, our networks, but, you know, we're, it's, we're not going to race to the bottom and how much we get paid and what our working conditions will be. And I want to make sure it's clear for me and the audience, when you join the union at an entry level, let's say, like you said, somebody wants to be a cinematographer, they want to be a director of photography. Can you join the union at at one position and change positions within the union? Sure, of course. You you know, and I, that a lot of people do that. You know, there um, you know you'll like the a typical path is you start out as a camera assistant, then you work as an operator, and then you um, you know eventually you'll start. You know, the DP on the show that you're working um, will send you off to do some small second unit jobs or something like that. And that will lead to eventually, uh, you know, you you getting to um, to shoot certain episodes, or you know, you I, you gain the experience watching other DPs working that you can then take. And I think this is this is another fallacy that you know, it's like if I join the union, I'm not going to be able to do non-union work. You hear that a lot. Yeah, and I think that that's you have to think about what that non-union work is if you know for example when i was an electrician i i worked non-union as a director of photography and you know what the shoots that i was doing were student films for you know columbia and nyu people but i would take things that i learned on you know on the bigger sets and you know and apply them in you know when we're shooting when it's like five people shooting with a 16 millimeter camera and i had you know a low light kit and that was it the good old days. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, it's like the union isn't going to stop you from doing that. The You know, the thing that they will ask you to do is call them and tell them about whatever jobs you've got, because there are some things that are, on um, you know, in a gray area where um, you're, you know, like they may have a contract there, you know, there are low budget agreements. And the, the reason for all these low budget agreements, the intention is not that um, that uh, you um that that people who are experienced and you know and who uh have something you know who who need to make a living are going to have to work for a lower rate but hopefully they will avoid those low but the experienced crew will avoid those low budget jobs and that they provide an opportunity for somebody who's been a camera operator or a camera assistant to bump up and you know who's you know and work as a director of photography because they're, you know, they're getting a lower rate. So the filmmakers get somebody who has some experience and who has some ideas, but is brand new. And the, um, and the, the, uh, um, the crew person, the, the director of photography gets a chance to shoot a feature that may go to Sundance or, um, you know, or Tribeca or whatever, and get themselves some exposure. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's how careers get started. So, you know, uh, like there, if you 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 could be working under a low budget contract, or the union could say, "Sorry, like you know, we can't, we don't have a contract that'll work for a seventy thousand dollar movie," and you know, good luck, and uh, we'll see you when you get finished. And that's you know, I've had that 
happened to me. Boys Don't Cry was, you know, kind of right on the edge. And, you know, the I did what I was supposed to do, called in the, you know, called the local in Texas. And they were like, yeah, there's nothing we can do for you on this one. Good luck. And that's, you know, I had at that point, I had kind of just gotten into local 600. So there's, you know, it like they're not going to stop you from taking work. They will try to organize whatever they think is reasonable. And, you know, and the rest of the time, they'll leave you alone. Well, I guess it's a good sign that we used up all of our time talking about this topic because there is so much to talk about. I honestly, I was like, yeah, we'll do half the episode and then we'll go into work. We ran out of time. So all of you guys, I apologize that, you know, if you wanted to hear stuff about, you know, that we normally talk about here at Go Creative Show, cinematography and lensing and lighting and all that, what are you going to do? It's This is a timely topic and I hope you learned a lot from it. I know I certainly did. Um, but please, and we'll put a link to your website, um, Jim, in the in the show notes because, I mean, you just have such a great, I'm, I'm looking right here. You talked about or a law and order organized crime that you're working on now, but there's Yellowstone, The Affair. Um, I said Wayward Pines, one of my favorite shows. I think it's underrated. So is I Get It On. I appreciate you bringing that up. I had a great time. Wayward Pines is awesome. Um, and Getting On is hilarious. It's so, so, so good. And you just have so much stuff here. I think this just means you have to come back and talk about a project. We'll, we'll, We'll focus on a particular project and get into the nitty gritty and do a traditional Go Creative Show episode where we can geek out about gear and equipment and all of that stuff. So that that is an order. You need to come back or else there'll be a penalty. That's what we'll say. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Where can people go to learn more about you, Jim? You can go to my website, uh, you know, jimdeneau.com. That's probably the most straightforward thing. I have an Instagram account, which is I underscore Dino underscore Jim. And, uh, you know, that's that's really the only social media that I have. It's complicated enough just, you know, putting the occasional picture up there. I, you know. I know. I hear so many times. Oh, you have to get a BC Media Productions Instagram. You get. I'm like, no, I don't want any more social media profiles. No. Um, just one. One is all I can handle. Oh, my God. Enough enough. And any suggestions of where people can go to learn more about the union, what's going on right now with the possible strike and, um, and just learn more about how to get involved. Yeah. I, you know, I wish I had the, um, the, there, you know, the international IATSE, a, um, IATSE website has a bargaining page that, you know, that has information. And I'm sure if you just Google that IATSE bargaining, you'll, come up with that page and then each of the each of the 13 hollywood locals also has the you know has information pages for their members iatse.com thank you so much jim for being on the show i'm so glad you guys are out there fighting the good fight and um we'd love to have you back so please let's let's try to schedule something thanks yeah i, I would love to be back and you know i i feel like you know, it, you know, it's you say we're fighting the good fight, but I, I think it's really we're just, you know, we're just doing what we do. Like most of us don't want to be this, you know, kind of distracted by all of this. But, you know, the working conditions, you know, have gotten to the point where we need to adjust the guardrails just a little bit. And so thanks for uh, thanks for giving me a place to talk about that. All right, I want to thank Jim Deneau, ASC, for coming on the show today and talking to us about a really important topic. And I hope you guys learned a lot from this episode. I know I certainly did, and I would love to hear your feedback. So please head over to gocreativeshow.com. Let us know what you think of the episode. And of course, on YouTube as well, you can put there in the comments and just let us know what you think, how you feel. And if you have any questions, please send them our way as well. I want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for putting it all together. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com and Dave Siegel from SiegelSound.com, who mixes and masters and makes the show sound so good. Of course, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you are not watching us on YouTube, you're missing out because on YouTube, you get to see the guests as well as just hear them, which is great. Uh, that FaceTime is really valuable and I think makes the show even better. So check us out over at YouTube, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And if you are interested at all in what I'm doing with my production company, BC Media Productions, you can find me 
on Instagram and Twitter, although I'm much more active on Instagram, at Ben Consoli, at B-E-N-C-O-N-S-O-L-I. Of course, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and we will see you next week on another episode of The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.